Hey, this is Pastor Jerry at Crestview Wesleyan in Ashboro, North Carolina. I want to thank you for joining us today for the online services we have. Uh, if you're a first time joining us, uh, thank you for stumbling upon us. I, uh, I hope you enjoy this message. It's a great message from Mark chapter 8 today. Those of you who watch week after week, thank you so much again for joining us. It really means a lot to me. So if you could, if you watch this, please like it and share it so other people will be able to to see it and, and have a chance to, to see the message that I have today. So as I said, I'm in Mark chapter 8, and, and in Mark chapter 8, I'm, I'm moving on down in the, in the passages today, but, but, but in the beginning of Mark chapter 8, this is the story of where Jesus feeds the 4,000. Uh, this is another incredible miracle of multiplying foods and and just with a very few pieces of bread and some sardines that 4,000 got, people got fed and there was a lot of leftovers. So this was in the Decapolis region. So it was uh, south and, and east of the Sea of Galilee in a Gentile area. It's not a Jewish area. And, and then after that, right at the end of it, when Jesus fed them and there was seven basketfuls of leftovers, they got in the boat, Jesus and the disciples got in the boat, they went across the lake, the Sea of Galilee, to the other side, to hostile territory to Jesus, the Jewish area, where these Pharisees that had been hounding Jesus, as we've been reading throughout Scripture, were there to hound him again. So they didn't believe Jesus, they weren't open to the good news, and they went to Jesus and they were just saying, hey, just just give us a sign, give us a sign, a sign from heaven, and and Jesus didn't do it because he knew that even giving them a sign was going to do no good. That if they came to him in disbelief, that he wouldn't do any good at all. So after that story there, the, the Pharisees accusing him and getting on him and, and just pressing him about things that in their disbelief that they were just not getting any answers for, not wanting any answers for, it says again, Jesus got in the boat with the disciples and they rode on somewhere else. And that's where we get to in the story today. So I'm going to be in Mark chapter 8 and I'm going to be starting in verse 14. So follow along with me. Man, this is such a good message today. I'm so excited about teaching this today. Starting in verse 14, it says, The disciples had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you not still, do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see, and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember, when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the four thousand, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. In verse 21, the last verse I'm going to read, he said to them, do you still not understand? So sometime during this latest trip across the water, the disciples remembered that they forgot to bring the bread. All they had was one little loaf of bread, and they were obviously talking about it around Jesus. Well, I mean, we're not sure if, if this bread, this one loaf of bread, was the leftover from feeding the 4,000 if they just happened to forget ba their baskets full when they were traveling across the water again, or if they just, you know, just forgot. <laughs> I, I can relate to this because it seems like as, as I'm getting older, there's more and more times that I forget things. I just remember just this week, uh, we all know the gas prices are going up and and I was at, at a grocery store and, and I just kept calling my wife, Cindy, over and over again and texting her two or three times. I said, is this all we have? Is it? Do we need anything else? Have I forgotten anything? Because I had forgotten a few things. And, 
and she let me know of a couple of things that, that I needed to get. So I can absolutely relate to what's going on right here. But Jesus, what he did, he, he used this forgetfulness of the disciples to teach an incredibly important lesson to the disciples today. And obviously, it's a story that we need to hear too. So in verse 15, Jesus just blurted this out. Be careful. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. And, and man, it's just, this just went right over their head. They totally missed it because they started thinking, well, is it because we just have one loaf of bread? What does this yeast mean? I don't, I don't know. But they were relating to what Jesus said to this one physical loaf of bread. But Jesus, by saying this, he had a critical warning for them. So what, what he's saying right here, what Jesus' purpose is in saying this is, don't let the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod fester or grow or rise like yeast in your hearts. This, this opposition that they both had, this disbelief that both of these groups had. I mean, th this can't happen to the disciples, right? Not, not to the ones that were around Jesus, always been around him, right? This can't happen. So, Get this, I mean, I'm just thinking through this. We know in Scripture that these disciples were called by Jesus. These disciples were around Jesus like 24-7 for at least a couple of years, probably working toward three years now that they'd been around Jesus. They, they'd seen miracles of Jesus. I mean, they couldn't be people that would turn into disbelief, right? Well... <laughs> Obviously, I mean, the, the obvious example is Judas Iscariot, the one who basically sold out Jesus. So, so understand this, this is an important point in, in this message today, is that the proximity to Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that you are with Jesus in purpose and mission. See, the yeast can affect you also. It can simmer in you even if you're in close proximity to Jesus, just like the disciples were. And, and again, think about this. Because they had their preconceived ideas about who they wanted Jesus to be, who they thought he was all about. They didn't totally understand his purpose and mission. Because even after Jesus was resurrected, they still didn't see clearly who Jesus was and what he was all about. Because we can read here in Acts chapter 1, I believe it's in verse 6, that after Jesus is resurrected, not long before he's ascended, one of the things they asked Jesus, the disciples asked Jesus is, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? So again, they didn't understand completely who Jesus was, that they thought Jesus was this... Um, warrior savior kind of like an an upgraded king david that jesus his job was to restore this nation of israel back to its glory that that king david restored it to way back in the day see they had their preconceived ideas of who this jesus was and it wasn't fully complete they didn't understand at the time that that jesus wasn't just the savior of a nation like Israel, Jesus was the savior of humanity. That Jesus was, was not only one who could defeat the enemy that would try to come into Israel, but Jesus did something much greater than that. He, he defeated sin, death, and the grave. This much broader, much greater, much bigger than, than just one little nation. Jesus was a whole lot more than just the king of Israel. Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. So the disciples had, had, hadn't had a grasp of who Jesus was completely. They couldn't see him completely. So Jesus, again, thinking about this story here today, Jesus was all sufficient and they just haven't fully understood that yet because of the questions that 
that Jesus asked start in verse 15. See, he said here, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts not hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And then he kept going on. Don't don't you remember this, that when there was 5,000, when I fed the 5,000, how, how much was left over? They said 12 basketfuls. And then Jesus says, well, what about this last thing where I fed the multitudes? How much is left over? And they said seven basketfuls. And he said, he, you can just see him just in disbelief. Do you still not understand, disciples, what's going on here? That, that Jesus is saying this, that he is all sufficient, that, that if he can feed 5,000, if he can feed thousands and thousands of people with just a little bit of bread, I mean, one loaf is, is nothing for Jesus. They're worried about this one little loaf feeding them. I mean, they just saw miracle after miracle. He is more than sufficient. But it's, it's more than just feeding them, right? Jesus is, is letting them know by this story that, that he, is, he is the bread of life. So they had, Jesus, they had Jesus watered down to who they thought he should be. But Jesus is teaching them here that I'm far greater than that. You've got to... You gotta, you got to dig deeper. You got to see who I really am. So that is is so important here in this lesson. So they just couldn't see Jesus' mission and his purpose clearly yet. So speaking of that, speaking of not seeing clearly, I'm going to move into the the next story today that that follows this story here about the yeast. And it starts in it starts in verse 22, and I want you to, to follow along with me. This is uh, another great story, another great healing of Jesus here, another great miracle. It says, They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then, the man, then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. So just a, an incredible miracle. But here's the thing that has, has stumped a whole lot of people. This miracle, and I'm telling you, it has stumped me for a long, long time. Why did it take Jesus two tries to heal this blind man? I mean, was was Jesus having an off day that day? I mean, was was Jesus spit the first time not sacred enough? Uh I mean, there's a, a lot of reasons. It, it, and, and I've read through it and I've thought about this. I mean, Jesus is perfect in every way. And if he's perfect in every way, why didn't he do this miracle perfectly the first time? It stumped a lot of people. I mean, for many years, it stumped me too. It's like, what does this mean? I mean, did Jesus just, was this just an off day for him? The one that's perfect to have an off day? I mean, how does that make sense? And, and it's, I've, I've tried to figure this out. And I got the answer one day. And I, and I listen to this. I just think this is so amazing. Because I got this from one of my professors several years ago when I was taking seminary classes. Uh, this, this professor, Dr. Stout, was going through, um, going through the Gospels. And we went through Mark that day. And... And one of the classmates of mine just asked a question about this very passage here about the blind man that it took two tries for Jesus to, to heal him. And, and this response from this professor was, was so simple. The answer was so simple and so profound that, that I remember this vividly. When he gave us this answer, every one of us in class just sat back and went, that, that is just amazing. I have never 
thought about this. And you know, sometimes in Scripture we try to make it too complicated. We try to read into things that are that are not there and try to figure things out. But but he made this answer, and, and it was it was just so simple. And and his answer was this. These two passages that I have just got through reading today, the passage about the yeast and in this passage about the the blind man, they're, they're actually connected. So what is going on right here when, think about this, in verse 17 when Jesus is getting on the disciples and saying, do, do you not see or understand? Can, can you not see this? Is exactly or very similar to what he's saying to the blind man in verse 23. Do you see anything? Well, what what Jesus is doing here, and this is, I'm going to try to summarize it so we can get it. See, Jesus is demonstrating visually with the blind man by showing him that, that it's taken two times for him to, to see clearly it's the same thing with the disciples and spiritually seeing see it it doesn't when we come into contact with Jesus it it doesn't mean that that right away we see clearly it's it's a process of spiritual growth in getting to know Jesus where we get to see him spiritually, his mission and purpose more clearly. Does, does that make sense? So again, just as the blind man, it took a process of him to see clearly. It's the same thing for the disciples in the previous story to avoid being, get in this trap of unbelief that it's a process of, of being with Jesus and through that process, they'll be able to see clearly. And here is, here is the key. And in both of these cases, to see clearly, it takes a continual touch of Jesus. So important. We've got to be in contact where he contacts us. The more he contacts us, the more we're in relation with him, the better we're going to be able to see. Man, that is so key to that. So let's just think about this. Because last week I talked about this word called paradoxes. The scripture is filled with paradoxes. Paradox, all that is, is it is, a, it is something that is opposite of the typical worldly concepts. So just for example, just for last week's lesson... It, the world and, and the common thing that the worldly concept is, is that seeing is believing. We first have to see things before we believe it. Well, Scripture, and Jesus teaches us this, it comes from John chapter 11, that it is, the Scripture is completely opposite, that Jesus is completely opposite, that the spiritual life with Jesus is completely opposite. We have to first believe before we see. See, that was the thing with the Pharisees in last week's story, is that they didn't have that belief. They were in disbelief, and because they had no belief in Jesus, were not willing to, to, to even try to grasp the gospel, the good news of Jesus, they would never see. But, but here's the thing, and Jesus is expanding it here in this story today, that belief is more than a, a one-time thing. It is believing is seeing. So, do you hear me? That is a continually being touched by Jesus is how we're going to be able to see Jesus more and more clearly. It's an ongoing thing. Believing is seeing. So, li listen to this. Improving spiritual vision, it comes from the ongoing, repeated touch of Jesus, just like we saw with the blind man. Spiritual growth is a process of moving from blindness to faith by the continual touch of Jesus. So just personally for me, I mean, in a way, I, I relate to these disciples. 
because I have always gone to church. I have very, very few day, church days have I missed. And, and during this, COVID is, is by far the most days I've ever missed in church in all my life. So in a way, I'm, I can relate to the disciples because I've always been in close proximity to Jesus. But being in close proximity doesn't mean that I have been with, understood his, his mission and his purpose of who he is and what he's all about. And, and it's, it's from this continual personal touch of Jesus is where I've, I've got to understand who he is. See, I had, for a lot of my Christian life, I've had preconceived ideas of who Jesus is and what he was all about, just like the disciples did. And I mean, there's a, there's a lot of factors with that, right? And just think about this, uh, the, the area you grew up in, the, the church you attended, uh, the, the people you hung around. Uh, you can think about even the color of your skin. All of that factors in to your preconceived idea of who Jesus is. Even politics. It, it all factors in to your preconceived idea of who Jesus is. But with me purposely trying to, to get his touch... To have him to touch me over and over again, am I getting to see a clearer picture of Jesus? And, and here's, here's what my personal touch of Jesus is to me. One thing is I'm becoming more and more of a student of, of God's word. The last, working on two years now, I have been focused in the gospel of Mark. Just looking at Jesus' life and his teaching what he does, who he's about, and just researching that and studying that and really working on that hard has really helped me to, to get rid of some preconceived ideas of who I thought Jesus was, just like the disciples. There, there are Bible studies where we're together. We had an incredible Bible study here this week, and the thing I love about it is, just like I was talking about, I had some ideas of what this scripture meant. And with other spirit-filled people of diverse backgrounds, diverse, um, is the same spirit, but looking at scripture, there were some things that were said during our Bible study that I'd never thought about, that I thought, yeah, this is right, this is the way to do it. But when, when other people, other spirit-filled people started talking in the Bible study, I was like, you know, that's great. Never thought of that. And that helped me develop a better understanding of who Jesus is it's a touch of Jesus. And I'll tell you another thing. This is me personally, and I absolutely believe this is so important, is that we as believers of Christ have to get out of the church and go out and do the things of Jesus. We have to, as Scripture says, not only read Scripture, but do what it says. And when you see who Jesus is and see who he hung around and see what is important to Jesus, the, the outcasts, the, the poor, the least of these, the sinners, that's who Jesus hung around. The, the more and more that, that I am being around that group of people, the more the clear understanding I'm getting of Jesus because that is exactly who he wants us to be around not just around always church folks which i love church folks i love being at church you got to understand me but for me to develop and to understand his mission and purpose i had to get out of the church and start doing things that, that we see that i read right here is is what jesus did and, and, I, and another thing is I've been more and more filtering out things that are not of God that so easily entangled me, right? And, and with that, doing these things, I get more and more and more of a touch of Jesus. I, I'm seeing his, his purpose and mission clear, and, I'm, and it's helping me to move more and more away from my, my personal preconceived ideas of who Jesus is. 
I'm telling you guys, the more you study scripture, the more you let Jesus touch you, the, the more you're going to flush away these preconceived ideas that you have that are actually wrong of who Jesus is. I can relate to that. I know I've, I've been there, done that, and I'm still there. Again, this is another thing that we need to understand. We will, on this side of heaven, will never see and understand Jesus perfectly. But that doesn't mean we've got to keep moving toward and studying and learning and growing and developing and, and getting to understand his mission and purpose more and more. It's important that we do that. Jesus warned the disciples not to be caught up in, in that yeast of, of disbelief because it is so easy to do. Guys, when, when you start drifting away from church, you say, you know what, I'm good enough. I don't need to do that. When you start drifting away, that opens up the door to disbelief. When you start moving away from his word and, and, and not reading his word like you should and really concentrating on that when you're away from Bible study or around other believers that are spirit-filled believers studying his word, I'm telling you guys, you're moving away from the touch of Jesus. The touch is not there like it should be. I'm I'm just so grateful for this message. The, this this growth of Jesus, getting to see Him clearly, is a process, just like a process the process of healing the blind man. It's a process that we have to go through, and it is a continual thing until we're done here on earth. So, guys, I I hope this is a a challenge to you today to get you to thinking about. Guys, don't sit on your hands. Don't say, you know what, I'm good enough. I know enough about the Bible. I've gone to church enough or I'm, I'm just tired of serving or whatever. It, it's, it's a continually moving toward Christ-likeness and letting Jesus touch you and guide you on where you need to go. Man, I just, uh, I, I mean, this message just means so much to me and I hope it means something to you. Guys, we got to find the real Jesus we got to find who he is. And I hope that you're doing that. And maybe if you're not, I hope this here prompts you to do this. Guys, I love you. I know we're going through some crazy times right now. We've got this mess going on in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, the prices of everything are going up. I know it's tough out there. But guys, hang in there. Stay true to the Lord. Stay true to the Lord. He'll help you through all this stuff. If you need anything, there's here's my information. You can call me or text me or... Or, or just call me. This is the church phone. Or send me an email. Love to hear from you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for your message. I thank you, Lord, that, that you're, you're teaching us today that, that to get to understand you better and to see you clear, it's a, it's a process. We have to keep doing it. And, Lord, we have to, we have to be ready for you to, to touch us and, and guide us and direct us in the way we could go. Lord, I pray that we never become stagnant, that we always learn, that we, we rid these things of our life that, that encumbers us, that keeps us from growing in you. I pray, Lord, that we be students of your word, that we be eager to learn from each other and to grow in each other. Lord, I thank you for this time. Bless each and every one that are watching this message today. We thank you, Lord, for all, all that you've done. We pray, Lord, that we grow with you in your purpose and mission. In Jesus' name, amen.